وقالك سبحانك لا نحسيت لنا أن عليك أنت كما أتيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملل على إلى يوم الدين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى يترك الأرض ومن عليها أنت خير والدين نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع الدفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحق على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وشيلة ومرضاتي وقربي وقوابه سبحانه وتعالى In the midst of looking at the chapter which relates to the praise of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم which no doubt is one of the more important chapters of Imam Busayri's work, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. In the work of Busayri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, for want of a better phrase, it teaches us elements of our, of our aqeedah, our i'tikad, our dogma, what we believe, as it relates not only to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but more importantly, the topic at hand, which is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. And after the clear illusion of Al-Busayri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, is the qualification of the thoughts of many Muslims when we say that praise is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by extension, praise is for whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises nobody like he praised his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. If we take a glance at the 38th line, which is فَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ فِي خَلْقٍ وَفِي خُلُقٍ وَلَمْ يُدَانُوهُ فِي عِلْمٍ وَلَا كَرَمٍ Imam al Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala said in his form and his quality to excel the other prophets. Their knowledge and nobility did not rival his own. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. We get a glimpse of who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam is. Maybe by nature of understanding who the Almighty being, the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are. And these are the elect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. And in terms of the hierarchical pyramid of being, that at the very top of the pyramid, the prophets themselves, the Anbiya. Allah Ta'ala, only Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows the number of the soldiers, the number of the soldiers that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has sent. As Allah Ta'ala reminds us inside the Surah Al Mudathir. And the soldiers of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala ordinarily are interpreted as two beings. A primary signification as well as a secondary signification. The primary signification is that the soldiers, the junood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioned in Surah Al Mudathir, are the malaika, are the angels. Why? Because the prior verses speak about the angels, in particular those 19 angels, those 19 angels that guard hellfire, that secure hellfire. And so, by extension, the ulama radiallahu anhum ardahum, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that only Allah knows the number of his soldiers, then that's a clear um, reference to the angels themselves. And so, the angels in terms of number, then their number is not known to us, it's only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it lose the great uh, amount of angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. You know, there are more angels in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than atoms in the universe. The second signification are the Prophets themselves, the Nabiyuna, the Prophets, the Anbiya. And there are different opinions about how many um, Prophets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. Some of the ulama are upon 124,000, it's a clear tradition. Um, the authorities in Abu Dhar al-Khifar inside of the, the, the Sahih of Ibn Hibban, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked how many Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, he mentioned 124,000 Prophets have been sent. In another tradition, 224,000. But the dominant opinion in theology, that only Allah Ta'ala knows the number of his soldiers, yani the number of his prophets, in excess of 224,000 prophets. And these beings are perfect. And what this verse of Ibn Busayri is alluding to is that they are perfect first and foremost in terms of their form, as well as being perfect in terms of their inner reality. And the form is called the khalq, as we discussed, the khalq, which is your created outward manifestation. And that khalq, yura bil basar. The khalq, your outward form, your al basar, is seen with ocular vision, with the physical eyes, that's what we call the khalq. And then they also have a khuluq, a khuluq, wa huwa yura bil basira, and that is seen with the basira, which is the eye of the heart, the khuluq. And the prophets, in terms of their khalq, their outward form, as well as in terms of their inward reality, they are perfect, the prophets. Beautifully outward and beautifully inward, like in the tradition of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, where he says, مَا أَرْسَلَ اللَّهُ نَبِيًّا قَبْ إِلَّا حَسَّانُ الْوُجُوهُ 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never ever sent a prophet saying that he's Hassan al wujub Hassan al wujub he's of excellent or perfect wedge. And wedge here in the Arabic language it has dual signification, which is the beauty of the language of the Sahaba themselves, is that it, it can allude to outward manifestation, but it can also allude to inward reality, the word wedge in the language of the Arabs, the entire being. And so the prophets are perfect outwardly and they're perfect inwardly. And remember, this is a context in order for us to begin to understand the reality of whom the Prophet is, because that's the context that Abu Sayyid rahimahullah ta'ala conjures up. The Prophet's outwardly perfect, a perfect beauty. For amongst their, their type, like we see in the Prophet statement about Musa ibn Imran, Moses' son of Imran, where the Prophet he says he saw right to Musa, Hadith and Sahih Muslim, that I saw Moses. And there he was, Darb min Azda Shanu'a. He said, Darb min Azda Shanu'a. Darb, here the word Darb means the finest specimen of Az Shanu'a. I mean, the finest manifestation of a tribal Az Shanu'a, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was Sudan Hadramis. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi here is just what striking the example of a tribal manifestation, physical manifestation of the like of Sayyidina Musa ibn Imran. But the key word we extrapolate from that is the word Darb. He's the finest manifestation of his people. That's saying the Musa ibn Imran. Just like Jesus is the finest manifestation of his people. Just like Ibrahim is the finest manifestation of his people. Okay? So if you look at the Israelites, there's nobody who's more beautiful in the age of Moses than Moses the son of Imran. Perfect in his manifestation. But likewise, also in terms of his character, radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. In one of the great works of Islam, which is the work called Dala'il al-Nabu'a by Imam Abu Nu'im al-Sahani rahimahullah ta'ala, when he speaks about the elect qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affords all prophets. Of the things he makes mention, he mentions four realities, but of the things he makes mention of is what he calls Fadilat al-Nawiya. And Fadilat al-Nawiya, that the prophets in terms of their Noah, in terms of their form and with reality, they're superior in reality. Okay? Superior to all others of their type, the prophets. Okay? He also has what's called Fadilat al ikramiyah that the Prophets likewise, over and above their perfection in terms of their human reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yukrimuhum, that Allah ta'ala is going to ennoble them with qualities that we're going to call miracles, athar or ayat. Hussein is going to bring that later on in the verses that we look at, which helps define the Prophets themselves and single them out as peculiar for amongst mankind. Here, Imam al Busayri faqa nabiyyina fi khalqin wa fi khuluqin. That our Prophet faq is above all of the Prophets. Fi khalq, in terms of his physical form, as well as fi khuluq, in terms of his inward character. And so, from the, yani the, the privileges that we as Muslims have been afforded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that we, alhamdulillah, that we have an inroad into or, um, apprehending elements of the khalq, of the physical form of the Prophet And so therefore he becomes the standard by which everything is thereafter going to be measured. So we look at the physical form of the Prophet which is Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas says that all the Prophets, Allah Ta'ala has never sent a Prophet saying that he's a beautiful form and our Prophet, Nabiyuna, he said وسلم, was the most beautiful in all forms. Okay, nobody was more beautiful than the Prophet That's why he could tell us in Al Bukhari and Muslim وسلم, when he ascended the heavens. And the Prophet وسلم, when he reaches the third heaven, the third sky, and he says, Ra'i to Yusuf. So I saw Yusuf, the Prophet Yusuf. And Yusuf, as we know, is يعني, 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 he's, a, he's a proverbial with beauty, the Prophet Yusuf. But the Prophet وسلم's statement about Yusuf, فَإِذَا أُوْتِيَ شَطْرُ الْحُسْنِ there he was, he was given half of beauty. Shut up. Shut up, he delusion, half or a portion of beauty in the Prophet ﷺ. And he mentioned about Yusuf. You remember I mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ can only speak about half or a portion if he has knowledge of the whole. Because it's half of what? A portion of what? And so he has knowledge of the whole, sallallahu alayhi and the whole is himself. That's why the Prophet says, as you mentioned, when he gaze in the mirror, Allahumma kama hasanta khalqi. Oh Allah just says, you've made my form perfect. And Busayr is going to speak about that the perfection of the outward manifestation of the Prophet وسلم, is not subject to what? Divisibility. It is indivisible beauty. That's the nature of the beauty of the Prophet. وسلم. Okay? 
So fi khalqin. And so the khalq of the Prophet وسلم, it's our standard for beauty period. And whenever we study the science which deals with this in essence, which is the science of Shema'il, if you study Shema'il, any of the science, any of the books of Shema'il, like the book of Imam al-Tirmidhi, or the book of Khada'iyad, or the book of Abu Nabahani, or all the Imams, radiallahu anhum, who wrote about the Shema'il of the Prophet وسلم, the Shema'il, it relates to that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, yani, encompassed the Prophet وسلم, in. That would that which surrounds the Prophet Sallallahu form and that which surrounds the Prophet Sallallahu soul. That's what the word Shema'il literally means in the language of the Arabs. It deals with his innate manifestation and his innate disposition, Sallallahu Alaihi So the entire discipline, it, it, it's divided into two elements. One is the khalq, and that's how it begins, like Imam al with these way. Ba ma ja'a fi khalqi rasulillah. The chapter as it relates to the khalq. The physical form of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, wa sallam. and then that physical form will then be described by many of the Imams. What's going to be common to many of those Imams who describe the Prophet sallallahu alaihi sallam, An example is Sayyidina Hum al mughayr ibn Shu'ba, or an example is Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, or an example is Sayyidina al-Bara ibn Azib, or an example is Sayyidina Abu Hurairah, or as an example is Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, or an example is Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu murda'hum. They all say a, a very a statement which in a sense khalas. It, what, it, it encapsulates for us the reality of the Rasul. Ma ra'aytu. I've never seen the like before or after him of him. I've never seen anybody before or after him more exquisite, more excellent than him. I've never seen anybody before or after him more beautiful than him. That's what you see in all of the in all of the, the tongues of those great Sahaba who describe the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sahi wa sallam. And so you see elements of his physical description because it's perfection for us. And the prophets are going to fall either side of the reality of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. So as an example, Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, and we're just playing this out, inshallah, tabarakallah, because maybe some of us have not had itila, have not come into contact of what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam looks like. And so Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda when he describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said لَمْ يَكُنْ بِطَوِيلِ الْبَعِلِ Hadith in the Sahih al-Bukhari al-Muslim لَمْ يَكُنْ بِطَوِيلِ الْبَعِلِ وَلَا بِالْخَصِيرِ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was not tawil al-ba'in He was not extremely tall وَلَا بِالْخَصِيرِ Nor was he short yani Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu in the Hadith al-Tirmidhi he says وَلَا بِالْخَصِيرِ الْمُتَرَدِّدِ Nor was he yani, really short sallallahu alay context for the society in which they were in. Because in the society of the Prophet ﷺ, you had people who were tawil al batin and the people who were exceedingly tall. When we might exceedingly tall, people who were in excess of eight foot in height, approaching nine foot in height, that which we don't see in our societies. But they had that in the society of the Rasul ﷺ. Like the likes of Sayyidina Ubadi ibn Samit, the Sahaba. Like the likes of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, the Sahaba. Like the likes of Sayyidina Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Sahaba. Like the example of Sayyidina Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Sahaba. Like the likes of Abu Jahl, the enemy of the Prophet Sallallahu These were people who were called Mukhattatun, that if, they, that if they sat upon a camel or upon a horse, their feet touched the ground. And when they would, when they would send the beast, then the feet would draw Mukhattat, that's what they call Mukhattatun. They would draw lines in the sand. That's they were exceedingly tall. Our Prophet is described by Ali ibn Abi Talib, by Hind ibn Abi Hala as Rab'a or Marbu'an. Rab'a. Rab'a is four. So he's min rijal al Rab'a. He's from the men who are four in terms of height. And four in terms of height meaning four arms lengths. Dhira'a. Umar ibn Khattab and those are called Rijal al Sudus. They're the men of six. Okay, so Umar ibn Khattab is like 50% taller than the Prophet sallallahu Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi what does he in, in our day and age, what's his height? His height atwal min al-marbu' he's just above six foot three in height. The Prophet sallallahu Which as we said is perfection of height. So somebody who reaches 50 is like six foot three in height, mashallah, tabarakallah. You've got one of the attributes of the Prophet sallallahu And Malcolm Gladwell in his work which is called Outliers, when he studied those extraordinary figures yeah, in terms of human history and in contemporary society. And when he looked at Fortune 100 leaders, those who lead Fortune 100 companies, he said every single one of them is over six foot in height. Every one of them. And then the majority of them, is like 70% of them, six foot three in height. 
For him, it may be random, but for us, it's prophetic. And the reason they're giving leadership over the companies that dominate planet Earth is because they have a sifa min sifat al rasul Because they have an attribute from the attribute of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Height, his atwal, height, is always associated with leadership. And that's what the ulama make mention about why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was taller than average, six foot three in height. But ma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would never walk alongside anybody. Ma ma sha ahadan, wa la jalasa ahadan, wa atwalu minhu. No, he never walked alongside somebody who was taller than him. Or he sat alongside somebody who was taller than him, save that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would appear to be taller than them. And so you see the hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet said he's walking hand in hand with Umar ibn Khattab. If you could see them walking hand in hand, the Prophet وسلم, who is six foot three and Umar ibn Khattab is approaching nine foot in height, the Prophet is taller than Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab. That's from his miracles. Because that's leadership granted to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and it's important that's the first description, Anas. Gives of the Prophet وسلم, and it's the first description Imam al Tirmidhi in his opus gives of the Rasul, the height of the Messenger of Allah. Araftum, laysa bil tawil al ba'in, wala bil qasir, walaysa bil adam, wala bil abyad al amhaq. The Prophet وسلم, is not Adam in Kola, nor is he abyad al amhaq in Kola. He two extremes Adam, abyad al amhaq. Yani Adam as a Kola is dark skin. Abiyad al Amhak, you could call it like yeah, dark skin. Abiyad al Amhak is like, like ex extremely sort of fair. And in white, the Prophet وسلم, is not either or. But the Prophet وسلم, tends towards Utma. Utma, the way Adam, is the color of his companions. So you look at the companions of the Rasul, like Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, described Ibn Hajar, Shadir al Utma, extremely Adam. Yani, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, Adam. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Adam. Sayyidina yani, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Adam. Adam, 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 Adam. You look through the colors of the companions, they're described as Adam. But the Rasul did not have the complexion of his companions. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa wa he was fairer than them in complexion. Okay? And that's what Abiyad, when he's described as Abiyad, Mushawish bin Humrah, it means he's fairer in complexion than the context of his society. Because everything is contextual. Of the Tabi'een who comes to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas Yazid, he says, Ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the dream state. I saw Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, he's never seen the Rasul, he's Tabi'een. Okay, he sees the companions, but he doesn't see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he asked Sayyidina Abdullah, he says to Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Rasul, who saw the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to him, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the dream state. And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Sif al rajal aladhi ra'ayta. Describe to me the man that you saw. And he begins to describe who he saw in the dream state from the things that he says, that he was asmar yameel il al abyad. That's the way to use. That he was dark skinned who tend towards being fair. That's the exact description he gives. Sayyidina Yazid radiallahu anhu wa ra. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas says, Lo ra'aytahu. Had you seen him, you would not be able to describe him more perfectly than that. I mean, you saw a perfect vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What we extrapolate from that is the long, the complexion of the Rasul himself Sallallahu Alaihi wa Okay, because that's the second thing Sayyid Anas radiallahu anhu wa rada brings. That's perfection in terms of complexion Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the things that we know perfect, the people who enter paradise. So when you enter paradise, Everyone say, Ameen. Ameen. Ah. So when you enter paradise, Ameen. inshallah, tabarakallah. Just prior to you entering the Hadith al-Bukhari, everybody's commanded to what to submerge inside what's called Nahrul Haya or Nahrul Haya. Okay? In the Hadith al-Bukhari. That you, you're commanded to submerge into a river which is called the river of life or it's called the river of modesty. Both are given in the Hadith al-Bukhari. And when you come out of the river, it's brand new creation. That's like in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Inna Ansha'na Hunna Ansha'a. And if better, we bring them forth as a new creation. That's when they emerge from the river of life before entering into paradise. For amongst the things that you get is the height of Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. And we believe the likes of Umar were tall. Adam was even taller. Uh, Umar like nine foot, Adam, alayhi salam, 100 foot in height. Uh, Sayyidina Adam, 100 foot in height. And that's the height of the people of paradise. Of the things that you're also given in terms of age is the age of Jesus, the son of Mary, i.e. Jesus, the son of Mary, when he ascended to the heavens. 
okay? 33 or 34 years of age, Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. You're given that. Now, the thing that you're given is what the Prophet Sallallahu saw in the third heaven, the beauty of Yusuf. Now, I know you want the beauty of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's just for him. As with Ghayr al Qasim, that's not going to that indivisible beauty. That's not going to be given to anybody but him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But, alhamdulillah, you get the beauty of Yusuf. Shatrul Husn, Ahlul Jannah, Radhi Allah Ta'ala Anhu And it's a beauty, yes, there, Husna. That in paradise, it only increases, mashallah, each lahta, it increases inside of paradise. And it takes quantum increase when you see Allah. When you gaze, ala wajhillah, when you gaze at the beauty of God, then you become beauty. Hakada, sir of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Part of the beauty of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that. that Perfect beauty that each moment is being increased, yet he took quantum leaps when he saw God. That's why Moses couldn't take his eyes off the Prophet when he meets him upon the sixth heaven. But alhamdulillah, in the tradition of the Rasul, when men who go to a specific location in paradise in order to see God, whereas women in paradise they see Allah Ta'ala from the midst of their own homes, from the comforts of their own homes, women. But when the men who see Allah Ta'ala return back to their homes, their women don't recognize them. Go, who are you? I don't know who you are. Why? Because he is yani, being created once again in a higher manifestation of beauty by virtue of seeing God. Alhamdulillah. But the asal, the foundation of our beauty is one half. It's al husnu Yusuf. It's the beauty of the Prophet Joseph, alayhi salam. Huh? But then, alhamdulillah, there are two things we're given. That relate to the Prophet Sallallahu One that relates to his physical manifestation and the other that relates to his inward reality. Khalqan, in terms of the physical manifestation, you're given the complexion of the Prophet Sallallahu His complexion. So everybody in Jannah, that's why I'm stressing at this point, has the complexion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Although the ulama are of the opinion that the complexion here means ukhrawi. It's a complexion that he has, he's granted by Allah Ta'ala in the next world. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And they say it's a dhahabi al-ukhrawi. It is otherworldly golden complexion. Whatever it means. And we have zero frame of reference for what that means in the next world. But that's the complexion of the people of paradise. They have the complexion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then everybody has the khuluq. The character of the Prophet Sallallahu and that's the greatest thing you could ever be given is to have the character of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. And so Sayyidina Anas Radiallahu Anhu wa Rala lam yakun bi tawil al-ba'in wa la bil qasir wa la bil adam wa la bil abyad al-amhaq Radiallahu Anhu wa Rada wa la bil ja'ad al-qatat wa la bil sabd and that his hair, the third thing he gives us is that his hair was not ja'ad al-qatat and ja'ad al-qatat means tightly curled hair. So the Prophet never had tightly curled hair, like we'd call uh, maybe sub-Saharan hair. He never had that type of hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. sept, nor did he have like northern European hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sept means lank or straight. So then what was his hair? Anas just negates the both. Then the clarification through negation of opposites. Sayyid Ali bin Abi Talib gives us the clarification in Tirmidhi, kana ja'dan, that his hair was ja'd. Ja'ad means he had curly hair. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. His hair was naturally curly. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam which is the reason why the Prophet said, would always carry two combs with him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of the combs that he would carry, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one is called the midra. The midra. And the second comb he would carry is called the mush. Now as for the midra, the midra is what we would call like a pick. So he has this type of pick which he uses to untangle his hairs. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That's called the midra. Two combs with him at all times, whether he's in Medina or whether he's traveling beyond Medina. The second is the mush, when he's untangled his hair, he takes the mush, which is like more so like a brush or more maybe a conventional comb, and then he would what he would comb his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, till after he finished grooming his hair, his hair would be like waves in the in the hadith, in his hair, like waves, his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which came down to his shoulders, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Even in his hair, Faqan Nabi. Even in his hair, the Prophet is over and beyond all the Prophets. The Prophets all, as a rule, they have long hair. When we buy long hair, the Prophets leave their hair natural. Because people's hair grow different. Some people's hair grows like this, and some people's hair grows like that, yeah. So depending on what Prophet you are, what people you're from, you just leave your hair natural. That's the name of the, the way of the Prophets themselves, okay? 
And so, so did our Rasul. We just leave this here. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Leave it. Rajil, as Sayyidina um, Aisha would say. Kana rajila. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hair was always well groomed. In another tradition, another reading of the hadith. Kana rajulan. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a man. That's the words of Aisha. Huh? That he was a man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the fullest sense. Imam al-Katani rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that all of those prophets, those nabiyyin that Allah was subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent, whether they're 124,000 or 224,000 or 224,000 and counting, they relate to the Prophet sallallahu one strand of his hair. That's it. They are put a strand of the hair upon the blessed reality of the Prophet sallallahu That's all they are. And that's in, in alignment with the tradition inside of the Musannaf of Abdul Razak. In the Masan of Abdul Razak, in the beginning of time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands all creation, all the Nesma, all of creation now to circumambulate the Prophet. This is a time where there's no arsh from a perspective, and there's no farsh from a perspective, where there's no Baytul Izzah for you to circumambulate, and there's no Kaaba to dunya, there's no Kaaba upon the earth for you to circumambulate. You circumambulate Muhammad. That's who you say, come on, believe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadith in the Musanna for Abdul Razak al And then everybody who's now say, come on, believe, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your character and your position in the world, your position in life is going to be reflected in your hair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your character and your position in life is going to be determined by what you see of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the Prophets are going to see the toppermost half of the Messenger of Allah. They're going to see his hair, the toppermost part of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they're not only going to see his hair, they're going to see a particular strand of his hair, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that determines their leadership from amongst humanity. But they're just one strand. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has all them strands and then some. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's important because this is all what plays out. And, it, and it's one line, but then you see all lines are going to play out under, that, under this context. That the Prophet are brought a juice, they brought an aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in reality, just an aspect of his hair. And that's why his hair is gem. His hair was not only long, but his hair was thick. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. Very thick. And he never cut that beautiful hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, say four times in his entire life. Fin, fin nusuk. When he was performing wa hajj or umrah, sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. The only time he ever cuts his blessed hair, sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. Sometimes you would gaze upon it maybe inside of Medina to Munawar, Mecca to Muqarrama, and you would see his hair without center part. But if you gazed upon it inside of Medina to Munawar, you would see his hair with center part, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you gaze upon the face of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what you see is perfectly arched eyebrows, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon that blessed face. That blessed face which abstractly is large. Dukhm ras in the hadith of Sayyidina Hind that he has a larger head, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That's when you look at it abstractly without looking at his form, the rest of his bodily form. But when you see his head in relation to his bodily form, Mu'tadil al-Khalq, the way to say the Hind, the son of Khadija, who was the most perfect of all of those who described the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was perfectly symmetrical. His form was perfectly balanced. You know, like they have the mean number, 1.6, which defines beauty. That, that, that number that they give you now, that they use now, the moderns are going to use in order to define what type of face is attractive to all human beings. That perfect mean. That Prophet yeah, he was the perfect mean. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And whether it's 1.6, 1, 2, 9, whatever number that they give you, or it is what, something else, it is Muhammad. That perfect mean. When you're gazing at everything that relates to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I say the inset in a beautiful and perfect way in the language of the Arabs, he, will, he is perfect in terms of his proportions. And his mouth is perfect. His mouth in relation to his nose is perfect. His nose in relation to his eyes is perfect. His eyes to each other are perfect. His body is perfect, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Everything's perfect about the Rasul. His foot size is perfect. And from the beauties of it, means subhanallah, right now we're working on the sandal of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi And so we have the measurements of the sandal of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa and the beauty of it, go home and try it. And you see if Allah Ta'ala has given you the proportionality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many people have it. Yeah, if, if you take your hand like that, and it's the length of his sandal, and you put two fingers, that's the length of his sandal. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the length of his sandal. And then if you took the bottom part of his sandal, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you put what? Seven fingers. Then you go to the midst of it, and you reduce it to five. 
and you go to the top of it and you reduce it and you increase it to six. They're the proportions of the sand of the Rasul. Draw it yourself with your own hand. Then put your foot upon it. And if your foot matches, alhamdulillah, are often that you now have a portion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that regard. In what regard? That your feet are proportional to your hands. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa in perfect proportion. Hakkad the Messenger of Allah sallallahu wa sallam was. Beautiful eyes, long eyelashes, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. His eyes were big in nature. And the, the, the pupils and the cornea were extremely dark, extremely black, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the eyeballs were extremely white. It's called Ad-Da'ij. Ad-Da'ij al in the Arabic language. And his eyes was Da'ija. Okay? White eyeballs with extremely black contrasting pupils and cornea. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The tips of his eyes here were oriental in nature. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's Fakhr. That is the glory of the, of, the, of the Far Eastern people. Those in the lands of China and those in the lands of what? Of Japan. That they have elements of the actual perfect form of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he had a perfectly aquiline nose, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. A very long mouth, dali al fem. His mouth was long, so that when he smiled, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a full smile, you could see all of his teeth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You try it. It's going to be difficult for people, most people, when they smile for all of your teeth to manifest. The Rasul naturally, all of his teeth could manifest upon a smile, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. He had a very, very full beard. Sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. His beard, most have it down to the qabda. When he held it like that, you wouldn't see hair manifest here. Sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. What's called one qabda. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although here, his beard thins out. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Then when you get to the form of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bigger, larger in form, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now if you see the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of your face and you're, you're going to say, I'm looking at a big man, a very big and muscular man. That's who you're looking at when you see the Prophet Always described, broad shoulders and all of his, all of his major joints, like here, were bigger joints. Very big hands, big knees, big ankle bones, feet, you describe the size of his feet, very muscular in disposition, to the day he died, he didn't have any fat content upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa They commented about it, that the, but that the, the stomach of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was flat upon death, sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. Umhani, when she gazed at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umhani, the sister of Ali bin Abi Talib, said he had a six pack, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we call it nowadays, six pack, not you, I know you don't have one. <laughs> but, the, but the Rasul had one, sallallahu alayhi wa sahib wa sallam. Hakala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, perfect in form. Imam al-Nabahani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said he calls him khalq al-awwal. What is khalq al-awwal? This is yeah, the, the fierce creature crafted. That's what he means by khalq al-awwal. He's not saying he was the fierce creature crafted. But when the fierce creature crafted, it was Adam, alayhi salam, was crafted by God. Allah crafted Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. He crafted the form of Adam perfect. And the Prophet sallallahu had that perfection of physical form, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. That's his form. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, faqahum. Yet he's above all of the Prophets who are likewise perfect, but perfection is of degrees. Eh? And his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows no end, knows no limit. The perfection of his form, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. That's so one of the beauties of the Rasul it's possible that people can describe the Messenger of Allah and they're gazing at the same reality and they describe him in different ways. That's possible, as you're going to see with the Sahaba themselves. That's what you call melakuti, that's angelic in nature. Because the nature of beauty is never static, never static. Raftum, then it changes. That's like the angels, Gabriel, doesn't come in one static form. He's always beautiful with different forms, different manifestations. And so the Prophet Sallallahu likewise, that's one of the beauties that we see inside of the dream state. Which one of us, Yani, which one of us, when we describe who we saw in our dream state, we're going to describe the same reality. And, and we're saying we all see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And guaranteed when we to get an artist's impression of who we saw inside of the dream state differs. Guaranteed if you to get awliya of Allah Ta'ala, the people of Allah Ta'ala, and then you get an artist's impression about who they're seeing in perfect description, and it matches the description in the Shema'il, they will all draw different people. And that is about who he is, not what their eyes or their hearts are seeing. That is a nature of beauty that has multiple manifestations. 
And that's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So faq al nabiyin fi khalqin, he's above the prophets in terms of khalq, in terms of his physical form, but likewise in terms of his khulq sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And he mentions of the khulq, wa la yudanuhu fi ilmin wa la karami, that they do not come close to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam in terms of ilm. And ilm is a khulq, it's a character trait, it's a disposition of the soul. And likewise also karam. Likewise, a disposition of the soul. The, the nature of khuluq, and in brief, khuluq returns back to four realities. This is our sort of scheme of what character is. How Allah Ta'ala crafts the soul of the human being. Okay? That the nature of khuluq, it relates to what's called desire, what you call nafs or hawa. Nafs, desire. It relates to what you call ghadab, anger, irascible faculty. It relates to what you call aql, intellectual faculty or intelligence or mind. And it relates to what you call just balance, what we call adal, balance. That which places those faculties into a state of equilibrium. Okay? That's what we call character. When we say someone's got a good character, what do you mean they've got a good character? Good character, first and foremost, it's all about balance. Okay? And you have to be the furthest from two extremes. Okay, the fairness of, from two extremes in terms of what? You have to be the fairness from two extremes in terms of intellect, intelligence. So, yani, an excessive intelligence, or my excessive intelligence, where people, they use their mind in an excessive way. Okay? That is blameworthy. That's demonic. That's the nature of demons. Okay? From it comes what's called makar, or caves, schemes, and machination, and wiles. Blameworthy. Or some people, bulada, it's laxity, okay, laxity. They're bulada, stupid, they're not using their mind. I mean, they have a mind. Everyone's been given a mind, alhamdulillah, but they're not using it in, order to, yeah, in, in its full capacity. So that's blameworthy. So what is perfection? It's when it's right in the middle, okay? It's in a state of balance. That's the mind of the Prophet wasallam. It is the furthest, yani, it's at the furthest point from two extremes. The mind of the Prophet And that can only be achieved when your mind is beneath the dictates of revelation. Okay, it's revelation that balances the mind. And so you say, well, all the Prophets, no doubt their mind is balanced. And you say, naam, their mind is balanced. But their revelation falls short as it relates to the revelation of the Rasul Okay? And their mind can only be in a state of equilibrium in accordance to the revelation that they receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the revelation of the prophets is all cultural, it's local phenomena. It's not universal. But the Prophet وسلم, has universal revelation. And so he has universal mind. The second is in terms of ghadab, balance, in terms of your faculty of anger. Okay? And somebody whose war, who's anger is to an extreme is what you call tahawwud. He's reckless. He's reckless, somebody like that. Huh? Somebody whose anger is in a state of laxity, he's a coward. The opposite. Where if somebody whose anger is in a state of balance, then that's what you call courage or bravery. And that's what the Prophet has. Okay, perfectly. Likewise, desire. Okay, you can have people who are profligates, greedy. You can have people who khalas, lack it completely. They have no desire for anything whatsoever. What is the purpose of life? They have no desire for nothing in life. Blameworthy. But placing it right in the middle, we call temperance, ifa. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ had. Okay? And you approach those realities through the doors of the companions. Like in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which explains his character. And a Medina to Sakha. I am the city of Sakha. And Sakha is karam. Okay? It's karam. It's munificence, generosity. And Sakha is when you give in accordance to your reality, not in accordance to the reality of the one who asks. Okay? So somebody, a man, could come to the Prophet وسلم, and ask the Prophet, a bedu, ask the Prophet وسلم, in Hadith of Anas, and the Prophet وسلم, can give the man al Jabalain, the entire valley full with sheep and goats and cows and camels, all that's yours. The Prophet, the man's only asking for what? For the, uh, dirham or dirhamain or dinar or dinarain, two gold coins, two silver coins, but he's asking in accordance to his want. 
and the Prophet gives in accordance to his want. Completely different. So he gives him, mashallah, tabarakallah, between two mountains, Allah alayhi wa sallam. So he said, I am the city of Sakha, the city of generosity. Wa Abu Bakr babuha. And Abu Bakr is just a gateway, he's just a door to that city. But I am the city, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you want to get a sense of generosity, because we don't get a sense of generosity with the prophets. That's not necessarily what revelation brought us, how generous the prophets were. But we get a sense of generosity with the companions. And we know about Abu Bakr al Siddiq at the Battle of Tabuk, when the Prophet he bring, the Prophet he brings all of his wealth and he gives it to the Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet said, What have you left for your family? He said, I've left them Allah and his messenger. That's all I've left them. And he gives his entire wealth, Abu Bakr al Siddiq. Yet he's just the door to the city of generosity of the Messenger of Allah. That's all he is. And then the Prophet says, And a Medina to Shuja'a. Remember, generosity relates to the temperance of your desire. And it's your desire for wealth, your, de your desire for money, your desire also for what? And it can also relate to issues that relate to other, sexual. But we'll come to that. Huh? But the Prophet وسلم, here, Sakha, it's all about generosity of wealth, generosity of food, sallallahu alayhi wa That which sustains man. Okay? As the Prophet وسلم, said, that which is between your two jaws, which means what you place inside of your stomach and one of its meals. That generosity. Then the second is, I am the city of bravery, of courage. Wa Umar Babuha. And Umar is the gateway to that city. That's all Umar ibn al-Khattab is. Umar, as is mentioned in the hadith, that la yakhafu lo matala'im. Umar fears nobody. La yakhafu lo matala'im. That's how he described the Khalifa al mustakhlaf in the famous dream of the companion, radiallahu anhu wa rda. That's Ibn al-Khattab. But he's bought a gateway, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, to the city of bravery, who is the Prophet Sallallahu I am the what? The city of temperance. He says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Iffa. Wa Uthman ibn Affan babuha. Uthman ibn Affan sahibul Iffa. It's in his name, Sayyidina Uthman. Ibn Affan al Iffa. That's Sayyidina Uthman. What does Iffa mean? It goes back to desire. Uh, but what type of desire is this? Sexual desire. The ability to temper your sexual desire. And that's Vunurain. That's the possessor of the two lights, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. He's supposed to gateway. And he marries the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibu sallam, Sayyidina Ruqayya. He marries the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And on the death, Sayyidina Sayyidina Umm Kulthum, afwan. And on the death of Sayyidina Umm Kulthum, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahibu sallam said, if I had a third daughter, I would give it to Sayyidina Rahman. Why? Because he's the gateway to the city of temperance. But he's what the gateway. He's what the door. But the city, yeah, I mean, with its avenues and its streets and its nooks and crannies and houses, all of that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Wa ala madinatul ilm. And I am the city of knowledge. Knowledge is mind now, huh? We're off them. It is bringing the mind to a state of equilibrium. Wa ali babuha. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is its doorway. Ali kayf. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rda. We'll give, you a, we'll give you a mathematical proposition. Two men, they're sitting. And two men are sitting. And two men. One has five loaves of bread. The other has three loaves of bread. Two other men come. And they come and sit. Huh? We'd say that even with, with these two men. And so what they do, they take their eight loaves and they divide it all equally. Okay, three of them and half one. And they divide it all equally. So there's five of them now. Divide them equally, all of them eat equal portions. Okay? Then when they finish, they get up. And they take eight, the, the, the guests have eight dinars. And they throw out eight dinars. That's for you. Okay? And so the, the man who had five loaves, he said, Eddie, five are mine. I'll take five dinars. And the other man, he said, you can have three dinars. The other man said, no, 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 that ain't fair. It's half, half. He said, how is it half, half? He said, it's half, half. Tired. He said, well, we're going to get the issue sorted. You're getting half. You're either getting five, or we go and get it sorted. He said, we get it sorted. So who do they go to? They go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They go to Ali. 
Amir al Mu'minin, the age of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so when he explained to Ali ibn Abi Talib what happened, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda, he says, take the offer of the man. He's offering you three, take three. He said, no, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not interested in three or what have you. I'm interested in the truth. I want what is mine. I want justice. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's got a balance of mind in accordance to what reaches him from revelation. He's, he's a gateway to knowledge. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, you want justice? OK, he takes seven, you take one. That's justice. Full stop. Work it out. And Ali, straight off, he takes seven, you take one. Go on, you mathematician from amongst Jews. We'll leave that to next class. <laughs> See how Ali ibn Abi Talib got to that in a split second. But he's put the gateway to knowledge. And the city is Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. OK? And obviously the reality of these great Imams of the religion, they represent the Prophets, as our Prophet told us with the likes of Abu Bakr and the likes of Umar ibn Khattab at the Battle of Badr. Ya Abu Bakr, you are like Jesus and you're like Ibrahim. O Umar, you are like Nuh and you're like Moses. And the Prophets are both doors. If the Sahaba maybe are outer doors to the city, then the prophets are inner doors, but they bought doors in relation to the city, the multiple cities of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't believe that it stops at Sakha, and it stops at what? Shuja'a, and it stops at Ifa, and it stops at Ilm, and munificence, courage, temperance, and knowledge. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi could have said that about each and every single one of his companions. <coughs> because, and then some. Because his attributes of perfection are unlimited. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama. But what we allude to are what you call yani, ru'us al fadail Are those sort of axiomatic, superior, yani, meritorious qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Type context, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll read, inshallah ta'ala, what Busayri has to say. وَكُلُّهُمْ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مُتَمِسٌ غَرَفَ مِنَ الْبَحْرِ وَرَشْفَ مِنَ الْدِيَمِ يعني, كُلُّهُمْ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Every single one of them from the Messenger of Allah are Mutemis. And they're seeking something of the Messenger of God. Any portion to define their reality. Gharfa min al-Bahri, handfuls from the sea, or drops of drizzle. And Rashwa min al Rashwa means like a sip. And he's sipping the rainwater that is upon the ground. That's all they get from the Messenger of Allah. From the greatest of the prophets, Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he's no doubt he's going to get yani, yani, He's going to get a handful from the sea of the Prophet But it's but a handful. And when Sayyidina Ibrahim takes from the sea of Muhammad He doesn't decrease the sea of the Prophet one iota. Araf doesn't. And likewise when people sip from what? From the water that splashes from his ocean upon to the shore bed from amongst the Prophets it doesn't decrease his ocean one iota, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is the prophets. What you're seeing is praise. And believe me, Busayri is not doing the prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, justice. But alhamdulillah, it's a good start for any one of us who want to begin to try to apprehend men who are. Who is the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. Wa waqifoon ala dayhi. Look at the way to even to show you the subtlety of Busayri. When he speaks about those who are being compared to the Messenger of Allah, he calls them Nabiyeen, prophets. But then he calls the Nabi the Messenger of God. Does everyone get the subtle point? Yeah, he, he categorizes the prophets with prophecy, lowest rank, prophecy. But when he speaks about the prophet, he doesn't call him the prophet. He calls him the Messenger of God, highest rank. That they're not even of him in terms of that reality. I mean, yes, they're all prophets. But when you say the Nabi, who do you mean? When you say the Prophet, your mind cannot think of Ibrahim, your mind cannot think of Moses, your mind cannot think of Jesus, your mind cannot think of Noah, Nuh alayhi salam, alayhi salam. Your mind can only think of Muhammad alayhi salam. There are 313 of them are messengers, are Rusul, 313 in our Aqeedah, Ibn Ibn 313. Of those prophets now move to a higher degree where they become messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you say the messenger of God, you can only think of Muhammad. Because they are his titles. 
That's the titles of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is Nabiullah, he is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Faqad Nabiyyim. And all of them seek from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a handful from the sea or drops of drizzle. وَوَاقِفُونَ وَوَاقِفُونَ لَدَيْهِ عِنْدَ حَدِّئِمِ مِنْ نُطْقَةِ الْعِلْمِ أَوْ مِنْ شَكْلَةِ الْحِكَمِ وَتَوَاقِفُونَ لَدَيْهِ Before him do they stand. Every one of them stands in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam عِنْدَ حَدِّئِمِ Are they at a pointed or delineated point? They do not transgress one iota in front of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, you would have got that picture like what Isra al-Mi'raj in Iliyah, a Bayt al-Maqdis. You would have saw all of the Prophets, every single one of them, waqifun ala dayhi. And he's standing right in front of the Prophet Those who are nearest to him are nearest to God. From amongst the Prophets themselves. Those who are in the back row, they're the ones who are most distant from God in their proximity to God. Hakadah, you would all arrange on that grand day, the Hadith al-Bukhari al-Muslim, waqifun ala dayhi. Standing in front of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi And he is the one who says, Stawo, keep your line straight. Siddidu wa qaribu, come together. Ah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, takhtalif qulubakum. Don't allow your hearts to differ. He's instructing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophets themselves, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Atimmu al-Ruku' wa sujood. Make sure you bow properly. I mean, I'm teaching you how to pray. You, you ain't had this prayer before. It's a new prayer for you, my dear prophets. Make sure you bow properly. How do we bow, O Muhammad? Just follow me. Make sure you speak sujood properly. How do you make sujood? Just follow me. Sallu, kama ra'aytu muni usalli. Pray as you see me pray. He's instructing the prophets, mashallah, tabarakallah. And what does it mean to be a prophet? And now in front of the prophet, waqifuna ladayhi, you're now learning how to pray, quote unquote, properly. The prayer of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's where they all learned, that's why it was their fakha. That's why the dominant opinion of the ulama, that it wasn't just before he ascended to the heavens, but when he came back, they were all waiting there as well. And he show us that again, <laughs> that prayer. And then the Prophet leads leads them in prayer once again when he descends from what from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Israel al-Mi'raj. Min nuqtatil ilmi aw min shaklatil hikami. Dots to his knowledge or vowel signs to his wisdom. I mean, subhanAllah. The ulama have two meanings of that. And what is the meaning? Dot to his knowledge is in capital H or small h, or vowel signs to his wisdom is in capital H or small h. Abrah, the most eloquent, is to make it a capital. Okay? That the prophets, the prophets themselves, are mere dots to the knowledge of God, and they are mere strokes, fatha, dhamma, kasra, sukoon to the wisdom of God in relation to the Prophet That is more profound than say small h. Like as we've, as we've used here, maybe you see a small h, to his knowledge. I to his knowledge, sallallahu alayhi wa Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mashallah, tabarakallah, he's created, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Allah ta'ala is the one who created him. So when you compare creation to the infinite, Allah ta'ala, you get zero. That's what you get. So they are nothing in comparison to the Prophet That's the metaphor, the best metaphor that Musaidi is striking. Both of them. You can strike him with Allah and you can strike him with the Prophet in relation to how the Prophet relate to the Prophet himself. So he it is whose meaning and form reach perfection. Okay? Yeah, his ma'ana is his khuluq, and his surah is his khuluq. So he's just, in a sense, Musayr is repeating it in different form. But his ma'ana has a higher signification. And when you say his surah has a higher signification, why does it have a higher signification? We speak of the Prophet in perpetual increase in beauty and perfection. Khalq and khuluq, those two terms, what do they allude to? Creation. His form is created by God. And his character is created by God. That's khalq and khuluq. That's how he begins what we'll say in our line 38. Now, فَهُوَ الَّذِي تَمَّ مَعْنَاهُ وَصُورَتُهُ Ma'na, that word ma'na, which alludes to character, is how you describe God. 
Surah. Likewise, is how you can also describe God. You, you, you cannot describe God by halq and khuluq. Those terms, hasha, you can never apply to the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they allude to that which the Creator creates. Outward form and inward reality. But when you use the word ma'na, and you use the word surah, both of them have applicability to the divine. In hadith in Mustafa Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Ru'aytu Rabbi, the Prophet said, I saw my Lord. In the hadith of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Mustafa Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Ala al surah, in the greatest surah, in the most beautiful surah. That's in the hadith. So that same surah applies to the divine. Have you got this? The second is ma'na. Those of us who study theology, when you study the attributes of Allah, what are the attributes of Allah Ta'ala called? Somebody remind me. Huh? What are they called? What's the attributes of God called? Huh? What are the attributes in theology called? Sifat al Ma'ani. They call the Ma'ani. Singular which is Ma'na. They are the attributes of God. They call the Ma'ani. And so now here, this is high now. Okay? That's like Subhruwirri radiallahu anhu warda, who will have the khalaq bi akhlaq al Rahman. That the Prophet was the one who inculcated the attributes of the beneficence of God. This is higher now. And they're tamam, perfect and complete. Difference between tamam, tam, and between kamal, perfection, is kamal is from a perspective. Tamam is kamal from every perspective. He is complete from every single perspective, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perfect from every single angle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. From Mustafa hu habiban, bari un nasan. Yet then Allah Mustafa hu, Allah Ta'ala is the one who chose him as what? As a habib, as the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who chose him? Bari un nasan. The bari is Allah, the creator, the one who created original purity. A nasan arus. Beings that breathe, that's what Nesami means. Beings that have a spirit, a soul, that breathe, that they have a breath. The creator of the human breath, of human life, of human life form, has chosen the messenger of Allah وسلم, as his habib. Just like the Sahaba radiallahu came into knowledge of when they're discussing about the various prophets. And the discussion discussing Sayyidina Ibrahim, Ibrahim is great. Why is he great? Because he's Khalil Allah. He's the intimate friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Jesus is great too. Why is he great? Because he's Kalimatullah wa Ruhullah. What about Moses? Moses is great, they're saying. Why? Because he's Najiullah, Kalimullah. Huh? Intimate friend of God. Moses is what? The one who had intimate discourse with God or was spoken unto by God and spoke to God. Jesus is the word of God and the spirit of God. And the Prophet وسلم, he overhears them speaking inside of the mosque وسلم, and he comes out to the companions and he says, yes, Ibrahim is Khalilullah. And yes, Moses is Najiullah. And yes, Jesus is Ruhullah wa Kalimato. Yes, but I am Habibullah. <laughs> <laughs> the Prophet <laughs> said, <laughs> Uh, too exalted in his beauty to have a rival. Munazza. That term, Munazza, is a term you ordinarily use for God. Like when you say Subhanallah. Subhanallah. What is Subhanallah? Tanzeel. Munazza. You are absolving Allah with Subhanahu wa Ta'ala from any light, from any deficiency. That's what Subhanallah means when you say Subhanallah. Tanzeel. Busayli uses the same way, Munazza and Sharikin. And he's leading to a point. Munazza and Sharikin. The Prophet, وسلم, like we say about Allah, La Sharika La. That's what Busayli is saying. In terms of what? Fi Mahasini. In terms of his perfect beauty. Munazza and Sharik. Nobody is like him. For Joharul Husni, Fihi. What he translated in him is the undivided essence of all beauty. But this means the Johar al-Husn, the Johar in the Arabic language, it could mean a precious jewel. 
In theology, the Johar, what is the Johar? It's the indivisible unit of matter. That's what Hussein is drawn from here. The Prophet وسلم, is the indivisible unit of beauty. La sharika lahu. He has no like whatsoever. Ghayru munqasim. That's what Hussein says, radiallahu anhu wa rahmah. Are we with it? Huh? Are you? I hope we are. Because if you get to that point, someone would just say, oh, 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 hold up a minute. What do you mean munazza? What do you mean la sharika lahu? What do you mean perfect? What do you mean? Because maybe some of us, in terms of our aqeedah, hada, oh Allah, that's Allah. And now at this point, you're comparing the Prophet Sallallahu to God. That's why Busayri rahimullah ta'ala said, da da'adhun nasara fi nabiyyihimi. No, 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 no. Set aside the claim the Christians made for their Prophet. And make sure, this is aqeedah now. Make sure we don't get confused with the khaliq and the makhluk. No confusion here. Allah is Allah. Intah al amr Full stop. And Muslims do not confuse anybody with Allah Ta'ala. Make sure that's our aqeedah. If you have some of that ishtibah, some of that confusion between Allah Ta'ala and the Prophet Ta'ala wa sallam, you've got to have to return back to yourself and purify your heart. Okay? Here we're speaking about the corpus of creation. Created beings. And the Prophet ﷺ, within the corpus of creation, nobody is like him. We all understand this? Okay? This is not a comparison between Allah and the Prophet. ﷺ. Because the reality there's no comparison between Allah and any of his creatures. That's our aqidah. And so here he wants to make sure that we understand this. And he draws it from the hadith in Sahih al Bukhari of the Prophet. ﷺ. With the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He said, don't go to extremities with me. In the same way that the Christians, the Nasara, went to extremities with the Messiah or in the Riwayah with, with the son of Mary. However, say the slave of God and his messenger. So you ask a simple question. And it's very simple because some people misuse the actual hadith in al-Bukhari. What was the extremity of the Christians? Godhood. That was the extremity of the Christians. They rendered Jesus God. Or they rendered Jesus the Son of God. Or they rendered Jesus as part of a trinity with God. That's what they did. So the Prophet ﷺ is ring-fencing that. Do not go to extremities with me in the same way the Christians went to extremities with what the Son of Me. Okay? Everyone understand this? After that, do whatever you like. And you're still not doing justice to him. What's important about that hadith as an example? Now, scholars can explain hadith by the chapter they put the hadith in. Do you understand? Like you want to look for that hadith, what chapter will you find it in? Like if it's an Imam at brings it in his Shema. What chapter does Imam at place that hadith? Don't go to extremities with me in the same way the Christians went to extremities with Jesus and Mary. He places it in the chapter of the humility of the Prophet Yet when he's making that statement, he's being humble. Where is he being humble? Not in relation to Godhood, because in Godhood he is humble. He's the slave of God. No doubt there's humility there. But he's also being humble between creation and God. Where does he lie? And when you're the slave of God, what does that mean? How great a statement that is. How great an appellage that is. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Isra, in the Quran, Subhanallahi asra bi abdi e layla min al Masjid al Haram, al Masjid al Aqsa, al Barakna Aula. Glory be to the one who took his slave by night, his slave. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah said that is the great, in his Badan al he said that is the greatest name Allah has ever called the Messenger of Allah. There's nothing greater, there's no greater praise than being a slave of God. And then upon the Arsh, you gaze upon the throne of Allah Ta'ala, what do you see? Muhammadun Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam. But when he calls himself Abdullah, he's still being humble. 
when he calls himself Rasulullah, he's still being humble in accordance with your fahm, your understanding of what does that mean. According to some ulama, in accordance to his own understanding as well, the ulama radiallahu anhu wa him say. That's when he says that the Prophet, even the Qadr Iyad and the Shifa, when the Prophet says to Abu Bakr al Siddiq, La ya'arifuni ghayr rabbi, only my Lord knows me. That's why many of the ulama say that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at junctions inside of his life, it's clear, that's what they say. He doesn't know who he is. Surah Allah, Surah Allah, Duha, Wa Layli Ida Saja. ما ودع ربك وما قال ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى. What does that verse mean? ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى. The ulama, Imam Ibn Ajib, Allah Anhu Warda, Imam Al Bajuri, رحمه الله تعالى says that verse means the آخرة and the أولى. These are seconds, breaths in the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And Allah تعالى is telling the Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم your next breath is greater than the breath that you're taking. Do you understand what that means? That in each and every single breath he takes, like you say, every breath you take, he's increasing in perfection. And so in the breath that he's in, he does not know who he's about to become in the next breath. And then when he breathes that next breath, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't know who he's about to come in the next breath, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the hadith in Sahih Muslim, of the most complex hadith in Sahih Muslim. It's a very difficult hadith, you only knew how. The Prophet says in Sahih Muslim, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ لَيُغَانْ عَلَى قَلْبِي فَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِرَارًا In one tradition. فَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِيَةَ مَرَّةً كُلَّ يَوْمٍ In another tradition. Very yughan ala qalbi. What does yughan mean? Veils are placed upon my heart. Veils are placed upon my heart. Such that I seek forgiveness from Allah time after time. Such that I seek forgiveness from Allah and repent to Him over 100 times each and every single day. What's the problem with the hadith? What does it mean, veils, on the heart of the Prophet that hadith is difficult. What does it mean, veils? May Allah Ta'ala bless the likes of Abu Hassan al-Shadri, rahimahullah Ta'ala. Because Abu Hassan al-Shadri, rahimahullah Ta'ala, he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inside in a dream state. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he asks about this hadith. I mean, that's the beauty of the ulama. When he have a problem with the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi comes to him and explains what it means for them. Yeah, mashallah, what a teacher they have. The ulama of connection to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet said him, calls in Abu Hassan al-Shadri, Ya Mubarak. He calls him, oh blessed one, you are Mubarak for asking that question. What does he mean, yughan ala qalbi? He says, yughan ala qalbi, it means, yani, ghaynul anwar la ghaynul aghya. He says, sallallahu wa sallam, it is veils of light, not veils of other than God, of creation, but it's veils of light. What does it mean, veils of light? Do we understand this? In our purification of our soul, there are different types of veils we have that prevent our souls from higher degrees with Allah Ta'ala and higher noses. We have veils of aghyar, which are veils of darkness. They come about due to sins. And we have veils of light, which are veils of purity that come about due to purification. So how then is it a veil? Because when you're in a state of increase unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in each and every single breath, when you take your second breath and you look back to your prior breath, you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the prior breath and the state you were in. That's the messenger of Allah in his degrees of perfection. He's seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every single breath that he takes because he's ascending in degrees, and when he looks down, it is down to where he's at right now, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And that's Abad al-Ahabideen, Sarmad al-Sarmadeen. That is literally forever his state. So set aside the claim the Christians made for the Prophet. Then compose what praises of him you wish, and do so well. Once we did that, he may shit him in Sharafin, once we did a Qadri, he may shit him in Idami. 
To his essence, assign whatever you will of honor. To his stature, assign what greatness you will. For the merit of God's messenger knows no bounds that might be voiced by the mouths of men. Words cannot express. If his miracle stood in proportion to his greatness, the very mention of his name would revive dry bones. And the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ is the Quran. The Quran that we recite. The Quran that we read. The Quran that we hear. And the Prophet ﷺ is greater than that Quran. Sure. The Quran you recite, he's greater than it. The Quran that you read, he's greater than it. The Quran that you hear, he's greater than it. And so now some of us are in shock factor. Oh, oh, oh. hold on, lad. Where you getting? He's greater than that. And he's greater. Why is he greater than that? Because the Quran you recite is created. The Quran you hear is created. The Quran you read, he's created. Who say the hawk? Who say the hawk? Kulihi. And he's the greatest of all creation. Do you understand that? This is theology. Don't compare him to the Quran that is God. That's different. We understand the theology that not many of us don't. And we don't have time to delve into that. But we as people of the Sunnah of Jama'ah, there are two Qurans. There are Quran and there's Furqan. Furqan is what we have. It's created inside of this world for us to recite for us to contemplate, for us to read, for us to hear. That's created. That's the belief of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. And then there's Quran that is indivisible. It is God. Mm. But when we compare the Prophet to the Quran that we recite, there is no comparison. Shuf, understand that, if we can. And maybe go home tonight and pick up a book of theology. I say, I've got to check that one up. Yeah, check it up. <laughs> the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so never mind any other miracle. Never mind splitting the moon. Never mind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam water coming out of his hands or food coming out of his hands or creatures speaking to him or trees speaking to him or birds speaking to him flapping their wings over them. Never mind the Prophet and those people bringing the dead back to life. Never mind all those other multiple miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam incomparable to the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa wa and if they could be compared to him, we would just have to go into a graveyard and say, Muhammad, and, and everyone will come back to life. That's the metaphor Hussein is striking here. He did not try us with things that baffle the mind. He did not try us with things that baffle the mind, although maybe for some of us, this dance is trying us with things that baffle the mind. Eh? I'm being baffled here. Such was his concern for us, so we neither doubted nor strayed. And the point is, yes, let us be baffled with the Prophet But let you can live Allah in the Allah Ta'ala does not bear than any soul with beyond its capacity, with that which is beyond its capacity. And that's the way of the Prophet why? Because Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, the gateway to the citadel of knowledge, what did he say? That a human being is an enemy to that which he's ignorant of. Or maybe that which baffles him. He goes into a state of enmity, rejection of that. That's the nature of man. And so the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he taught was always palatable. And khatibun nas ala qadri ubulihim, he would say. Speak to people in accordance to their mind. Descend to their level, he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do you want people to, de to deny God and his messenger? Or do you want people to deny Abu Qasim, he says in the Riwayah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So speak to them in the court of their intellect, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And that's his way, and that's what the verse is alluding to. A'yal wara, fahma ma'na fa laysa yura fi al-qurbi wal wa'di fi ghayru munfa'in. Understanding his meaning, his meaning rather means his reality, his soul, Exhaust the human mind. Near and far, always seem to be dawn struck. 
Yani, it's as if the one who's the furthest from the Prophet Sallallahu and the one who's the closest from the Prophet Sallallahu whether that is in terms of knowledge, whether that is in terms of piety, whether that is in terms of character, or even in terms of distance, physical distance, or in terms of time, it's as if they both have the same knowledge about him. Nothing. That's what he said. And that's in the, the beautiful tradition, radiallahu anhu wa rab, saying no waste of karmi. How Uwais used to teach his people, radiallahu anhu wa rab, say the tabi'een, the greatest of the tabi'een, say no waste of karmi, rahimullah ta'ala. And he speaks to the gateway to bravery, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he speaks to the gateway to knowledge, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he said, the only knowledge you have of him is knowledge of his shadow. That's all you know about the Prophet And you're speaking to two of the greatest beings ever. You only have knowledge of his shadow. And the Prophet has no shadow. And what is he saying to them? He is like the sun, due to the eye at a distance it seems small, but when near it dazzles the sight. As one of the poets said, the fault is in your eye, not in the smallness of the star. But when that star or that sun is brought close, it will be dazzling. And that's the Prophet in the hadith in paradise, when he's brought close, you know what brought close means? When the veil is revealed from the Muhammadan reality in paradise, the hadith says, the people of paradise, paradise, from the greatest of them to the lowest of them, fall into a state of sujood when he manifests in Jannah. Why? Because they believe he is God. How can they make that mistake? But they do. Because of the bedazzling reality of the Prophet ﷺ. Until they're informed, Kumu, you're prostrating to the wrong being here. But they make that mistake inside of the hadith. How can his reality be grasped in this world? How can his reality be grasped in the next world? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. How can you grasp the reality of the Prophet ﷺ? by a people who are asleep, as the Prophet ﷺ says, and nasu niyam, people are asleep. in But when they die, they wake up. And when you wake up, you see Muhammad. And what do you say about this man in the Hadith and And the majority of human beings, ah, ah. Ladri, I don't know. That's what they're going to say. That's what Busayri said. What came for you to look for dunya haqiqata? niyam, people who were asleep, distracted by him by dreams. And that is what the dunya is for us dreams. Yom al ba'da yom, day or part of a day. Famablag al ilmi and no basha. When no khayru khalqi lai kulli gimi. The most we know of him is that he's a mortal man. That's it. Bashar. He's just a man. And that's all we know about him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Bashar. And he told us, inna ni ana bashar. That's Allah commands him, inna ni ana bashar. I am a bashar, mithlukum, just like you. And we should be happy he's bashar, just like us. Midrullah what do they say about that? That when you see the Prophet, sallam, you notice he's got a head like I've got a head. He's got eyes, like I've got eyes. He's got brows, like I've got brows. Lashes, like I've got lashes. Nose, nostrils, like I have. A mouth, like I have. Teeth, like I have. Mashallah, a beard, like I have. Not you, sister. <laughs> huh? He's got body, like I have. Hands, like I have. Fingers, like I have. Nails, like I have. Legs, like I have. Feet, like I have. Toes, like I have. Toenails like I have. That's it. That's all he has like you have. The rest, khalas, is completely different and you don't have a clue. That's mablag al That's the majority, that's the extent of your knowledge about the Prophet As they give us like stones, you can take a rock from a street and you can take diamonds out of Gail's best friend. And you go and offer your wife a stone from the street and tell your wife you love you. 
I'll tell you what you'll do with the stone. I'll tell you now what you'll do with the stone. I'm <laughs> often. So don't compare a stone to a diamond. I don't compare a human being to the Prophet ﷺ. And that he is the best of all God's creations. Every miracle which the noble messengers brought was theirs by virtue of his light alone. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. فَإِنَّهُ شَمْسُ فَضْلٍ هُمْ كَوَاكِبُهَا يُذْهِرْنَ أَنْوَارَهَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي الظُّلَمِ For he is the sun of virtue and they are its planets. Amid the shadows they display its rays to humanity. I mean, look at the beauty of Al-Busayn, the awliya. I mean, Busayn is speaking about something we didn't know. Towards you see the planets inside of the skies and you think that they are, that they have light of their own. But they don't have light of their own. They just reflect the light of the sun. And even those other orbits in the sky that do have light of their own, called stars, when the sun manifests, every single star disappears. Hakam, the light of the Prophet ﷺ. There is no light but his light. And his light is drawn from the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who know where the sama wa ta'ala, the illuminator of the heavens and the earth. Akrim bi khalqin nabiyin zanahu khuluqun bil husni mushtamilin bil bashri muttasimi. How noble the qualities of a prophet adorned by such traits. How full is his beauty, how gifted with smiling joy. <laughs> as a flower in delicacy, as the full moon in honor, like the sea in bounty, as persistent as time itself. As a flower, Zahar, and that's how he's described, Azha, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's called well, Azha, like fragrant, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In terms of his reality, he was more fragrant than the best of musks, like in the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. Of Sayyidina Anas, Radiallahu Anhu, Warda, Ma Masastu Dibajan, Wala Hariran, Alian Min Kafi Rasulillah. I've never touched silk or brocade that was more smoother than the palms of the hands of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وما شم شممت عنبر القط ولا مسك القط أطيب من ريح الرسول الله أنا أبى سمعت عنبر period or musk period that is more fragrant than the messenger of God صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم he was born fragrant and he was fragrant and he increased in fragrance but as we said about his beauty it took quantum leaps when he saw Allah تعالى and this was Mi'raj that we say from that point on, then the fragrance of the Rasul could be perceived by all. You knew what street he was in Medina to Manawara by his smell. You knew what child he had touched upon the head by his smell. You knew what body he had touched by the smell of that body. You knew who was getting all the business inside the Medina to Manawara, selling perfume by the sweat of the Rasul which was inside of that perfume. That's the one who's kazahri fi tarafin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, wa badri fi sharafin. And it's like the full moon, sharaf, the night of the 14th, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In terms of its nobility and sharaf, in terms of its ulu. Sharaf is always when you look up. And when you look up the biggest orbit, mashallah, tabarakallah, is out of the sky at night in the midst of darkness, is the full moon. And that's the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ta'ala alu. Badaru alayna, in the badr that has appeared in front of us, risen over us, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. wa sallam. Fa'idha huwa ahsan min al-badr. Fa'idha huwa ahsan min al-qamar in the hadith al-muwatta. Nadartu ila al-qamar. I gazed at the full moon, and then I gazed at the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then I gazed at the full moon, and I gazed at the Prophet. Can you imagine somebody doing that? That's all they're doing. And then he says, فَإِذَا هُوَ أَحْسَنٌ مِنَ الْقَمَرِ And he is more beautiful than the full moon. Yet we don't get it, but in the language of the Arabs, there is nothing more beautiful than the full moon. Nothing. In language and literature, in metaphor, nothing more beautiful than the full moon. There he is, more beautiful than the full moon, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالْبَحْرِ فِي كَرَمٍ And he's a bahr, he's an ocean in terms of his karam. And that which the Prophet touches becomes bahr. Like in the hadith of Sayyidina Abu Talha. When he's upon the horse of Abu Talha, إِنَّهُ لَا بَحْرَ Verily, it's a bahr. A horse that was well finished. 
And then it came back to life by virtue of the Prophet ﷺ arriving that blessed horse. And it's like time in terms of its persistence or in terms of its aspiration, the Messenger of Allah. Such is his splendor that even alone in his glory, superb courtiers and guards seem to stand around him. And remember when you think about it, you have to think about who he was. You know, they said you can tell people by who surrounds them. You can tell who a person is by who their company is. Al-Marru ala dini khalili, the Prophet is. Uh, look at the Prophet The Prophet hangs out with Gabriel. The Prophet hangs out with Mikael. The Prophet hangs out with Israfil. Hangs out even with Azrael. He hangs out with Ibrahim. He hangs out with Musa and Isa. And he hangs out with Nuh. The Prophet hangs out with Abu Bakr. He hangs out with Fatima Zahra al he hangs out with Khadija radiallahu anhu and Bawardah. Hangs out with Umar ibn Khattab and Zainab and Aisha. Look, look who's around him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yani, if the only friend we had was Gabriel, mashallah, if you actually hang out with Gabriel, let me touch you for barakah. If the only friend that you had was Abu Bakr the Siddiq, please let me smell you for barakah. And the Prophet Islam has all of the greatest of Allah Ta'ala's creatures, creatures as his hair shia, as his posse. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Hakan the Messenger of Allah. Ka'annama lu'lul makloonu fi sadafin min ma'adini mantiqin minhu wa mubtasami. For the rich mind of his speech and his smile hidden pearls seem to sparkle from their shah. That's what he said when he spoke, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. His speech, saying the Hindi bin Abi Hala, the hadith, says his speech was like a ray pearls coming out of his mouth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu wa ta, they embraced every single word that he took, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to speak in a way that they could want, that they could gather and memorize every single word. That's why if they struggled, they would complain like Abu Hurairah of the lack of ability to memorize anything he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we take the rida, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam, of Abu Huraira, the scarf of Abu Huraira, spread it out, open it. He opens it, puts some blesses it, ugrufu, get hold of it, it's yours, he takes it. So I never forgot a single statement from that day on. Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu wa arda, says, pearls come out of his mouth. The Sayyidina Hindu, anhu wa arda, prophesies of in his teeth here. These two front teeth, he has a gap. In his two front teeth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yakhruj kanur. From it comes that which is like light. Talk from our teacher says, like light. Yani, yani, you're doing injustice to the Rasul when you compare him to light. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what they said. It's like light, meaning light is lower than what's coming out of the mouth of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he speaks, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how you see it. When he speaks, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. For he's from the rich mind of his speech and his smile, hidden pearls, seem to sparkle from the Isha. That's one of the most beautiful things his companions ever experienced. The smile of the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do we understand? That is their very last image of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they're all in the midst of prayer, when the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, opens the curtain from the house of Aisha, and he gazes into the mosque, and then in the midst of prayer, and he just smiles, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the hadith, yiftetin, they're in a state of fitna, the companions, radiallahu anhu. And the hadith is more complex than you think. Because if that's Qibla, he's smiling from there. How can they see it when they're all facing that way? And he's smiling from that direction, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's as if he's in the midst of their prayer. That's the prayer of Muhammadan beings. When they say, assalamu alayka, ayyuha nabiyu, wa rahmatullahi, wa barakatuh, peace be upon you. Not peace be upon him, somebody who's absent. Peace be upon you, somebody who's right in front of me in the midst of prayer. That's, they haven't fit in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. In the midst of prayer, because he's smiling. And then the Prophet wasallam, his last words, As-salah, 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 as-salah. Prayer, 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 prayer. And he closes the curtain, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa rafiq la'ala, to the highest company. And he returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. But what, what, what is Your last image of him is a smile. 
And when they would see him as well, Adhaqallahu sinnaka ya Rasulullah. May Allah make you smile more, O Messenger of God. The pills that they take from his beautiful array of teeth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La tiba ya'adilu turban, dhamma a'adhamahu, tuba limuntashikin minhu wa mutafin. No perfume can rival the air that holds his bones. No perfume. No perfume whatsoever. I mean, the, the, the soil of the, the umr of the Rasul is blessed. Look at Aisha in the hadith, that the, the, the nikas, uh, ashama, when he died, you could smell musk coming from his grave, hadith of Aisha. Aisha, the, the, the Najashi, the nikas who becomes Muslim, dies in the ninth year of Hijrah. You could smell musk coming out of his grave. He's from the umr of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al-Bukhari, the, the, the governor of the time of Bukhari, he had to prevent people from the graveyard of al-Bukhari. Why? Because they were taking so much of the soil of Bukhari because of its fragrance, they thought he was, they were going to excavate the body of Bukhari. People were just taking soil and soil out of the grave of Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail. And he's put a member of the law of the Umar of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi What about the Rasul himself? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that blessed air, which is the greatest air or space in the entire universe by the absolute consensus of the people of Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Absolute consensus. That is the greatest space in the entire universe. And that air we touch it is the greatest air or particles in the entire universe. And if that's not enough for you, then take the hadith of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. How she would go to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi air father alayhi salam and take the air and begin to smell the earth of the Prophet Sallallahu grave and place it upon her forehead, Sayyidina Fatima Zahra al-Batul. What then do you say about the great woman and the act that she's doing, radiallahu ta'ala anha, wa ardaha? No perfume can rival the air that holds his bones, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Blessed are they that breathe its fragrance or kiss it. May Allah Ta'ala render us from them, Ameen. May Allah render us from them, Ameen. May Allah Ta'ala render us from them, Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.